All right. Uh, so here's the plan for uh, uh, the next few day, uh, days of the course. Uh, next uh, Monday, you have your uh, second prelim. And this will, uh, second prelim will uh, consist of uh, things we have covered in assignments at least till the, uh, till the next uh, uh, um, Monday. Uh, but so essentially till the end of chapter eight, not much of chapter nine, but a little bit of it. You know, I mean, I think uh, uh, again, uh, keeping with the same philosophy as the uh, last time that uh, to these topics are intertwined in quite a, a strong way. So, uh, but, uh, uh, and the plan for the next, uh, for this week is uh, today I want to finish uh, the last couple of remaining topics of uh, 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 laser dynamics um, from chapter 9 of the book and then uh, get started with uh, uh, various kinds of lasers. This is uh, chapter 10 where uh, what I want to do in the next class which is Wednesday is uh, start from kind of um, reverse order as in the chapter. We'll start with a, uh, a somewhat of an unconventional laser which is the uh, quantum cascade laser. And then we will look at the more conventional ones or the older ones. Uh, and uh, before uh, the midterm, so that would be Friday, we'll do a short review again of, of uh, things we have covered till now. Uh, and just to keep things in, per look at the bigger picture of what we have covered till now. And then uh, right after the midterm, uh, Cliff will discuss a few more uh, of uh, kinds of lasers. and. Uh, then we will spend about maybe two weeks of the course uh, or you know uh, about six five or six classes talking in particular about a semiconductor laser which is extremely important today in a uh, 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 lot of applications so we'll talk about that particular laser in a lot more detail than some of the other lasers in, in this course so that's the plan moving forward uh, uh, in the next, uh, uh, you know, two or three weeks or four weeks, let's say, yeah. Okay, so uh, we were discussing about uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, one uh, peculiar uh, aspect of laser dynamics. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, have you collected homework Sorry? Have you guys collected homework Yes, yet? actually I, I realized I couldn't pick it up today. It's been graded and uh, it's ready to pick up. So what I'll do is after class I'll email everybody that pick it up from here. You know. okay. it's, it's ready to be picked up. And, uh, so, yeah. Are you guys uploading the... Uh, the solutions would be also uploaded. For, sorry? Uh, are you guys up to uploading lecture videos so that we can, we can review for the previous? You mean the lecture slides or something like no, that? No, the, 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 the recording, the video. Ah, so the videos are uploaded till uh, I think lecture 13 or yeah. something like that and uh, uh, the answer is uh, no, we are not doing that. You know, we are not uh, uploading unless we have missed classes or something like that. It's, uh, it will be uploaded you know, later on, not right now, bec not, not before the midterms. You know, so so uh, that, uh, right, okay. so there, there are many reasons for it, so yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll <coughs> so we're talking about uh, uh, this aspect of uh, uh, mode lock lasers, and if you remember, uh, one of the reasons we're motivating why uh, uh, do mode lock lasers uh, is, is is because uh, you can in Q switch lasers you can actually get quite a bit of energy, but the repetition rate of uh, uh, the pulses that you generate are not very high, so it can be typically in uh, uh, kilohertz or uh, something like megahertz, uh, whereas uh, uh, in, 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 in the mode lock lasers uh, you can actually have much faster, uh, uh, close to gigahertz sort of uh, repetition rates. Uh, now, uh, there are uh, pros and cons and I'll mention later what is the drawback of a mode, bo mode lock laser. So what we'll see later is uh, in the mode lock laser all really what we are doing is we are taking the CW level and then we are uh, bunching it up into very short pulses in time domain, right? And, and, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, if I had, uh, so I'm still kind of restricted in the total area under the curve. The total power of this is effectively <coughs> similar to, I mean, it can be much larger in a short pulse, but the total energy, sorry, not the power, but the energy is not too different from the CW. Whereas in the Q switch laser, you get a lot more energy not power, but energy. You know, energy would be integrated over the old pulse, right? Uh, that's because you go way out of equilibrium. I mean, the 
uh, you go way out of uh, the uh, threshold required for population inversion, right, in a Q-switch laser, if you remember, right? So that, that's the reason you can dump a lot more energy out in one pulse, but you cannot repeat too often. So what we're going to, uh, t uh, we had talked in the last class is just a very simple mathematical uh, way of thinking about what is this, uh, how do you explain uh, a mode lock laser? Uh, one way to look at it is, well, we have, uh, let's say, inhomogeneously broadened gain spectrum, uh, inhomogeneously broadened gain spectrum of the laser gain medium, which could be gas or, you know, atoms and, uh, 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 and then, uh, and and then, basically, within that, I can do something to uh, make sure that a lot of these FSR modes, cavity modes, longitudinal cavity modes, fall within that gain spectrum. And uh, and then, when I, you know, uh, try to start, uh, you know, when I start the lasing, I think we have already learned that only one, the gain spectrum, will saturate every time you deplete your your uh, population inversion. Uh, every time you create a stimulated emission, uh, you decrease uh, N2 and you increase N1, right? Every time there is a stimulated emission, you decrease this by one and increase that by one. So, so uh, 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 and then the gain, which is, <coughs> uh, the gain uh, um, w w would be effectively N2 minus, you know, your G2 over G1 and 1 times, uh, you know this uh, cross uh, the the cross section. This essentially drops and this increases, so the gain is going down, and therefore this whole curve is coming down. And then you kind of lock to one of the modes, and then essentially that that's a single mode lasing. Right? So, so that's how you uh, actual uh, normal laser works. But now what we are doing is we are putting in something extra into the cavity, such so that instead of locking into one mode, it lets you to to essentially it, it it lets a few of these modes to survive, a few of these modes to survive, and their phases or uh, something about them, some property of these modes is locked, right? and, 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 and therefore they, uh, you have multiple modes, and I think uh, uh, we know that if you, in frequency domain, if you have multiple peaks here, in time domain, you will also develop multiple peaks. You know? so, so this is a uh, very classic, uh, or, or, or in, in a way, one of the uh, ideas of Fourier transform that in frequency domain, if uh, uh, we have a delta function in time domain, it's a constant, if you have two, then you get you know beats. If you have three, you get sharper beats, right? And if you get four or five, you start getting what looks like just a time domain pulses. You know? This is this is the idea, really, right? So, so a, a Fourier transform of this delta train is also a delta train in some sense in in, in, in time domain. So, so that's one function that remains uh, uh, a, a comb a comb function in both both domains. Okay, so that this mode lock laser takes advantage or is an application in some sense of this uh, mathematical idea of a, a Fourier transform of a, a multiple uh, delta functions here. Okay. So roughly, and, and that's how we are modeling it. In the last class, we were just saying that you can model it in the time domain uh, or you can model it in the frequency domain because in both domains, it's a series of spikes. Uh, and what we had done in the last class is just that, okay, I'm going to take each of these modes as with an electric field EN amplitude, and it's oscillating with the center frequency omega naught, and then I go, you know, right, left, I mean, I have the FSR on the right side, right? And I, uh, I have omega naught plus an integer times the FSR here, which is omega C. And you have all these frequencies, so each frequency has a certain amplitude of vibration for the electric field, and then I add in a random phase for each mode. You know? So that's what we had done there. And from there, uh, when you add up these functions, we made some assumptions. We said, well, let's assume for simplicity all the electric fields in each of these modes, the amplitude is the same, E naught, E naught. Then you can sum it exactly. You get a sync function, right? And the intensity is square of electric field divided by impedance of free space, two, two times that, and you get the sync square function. And from here, uh, when you plot the sync square function, you will get this with the little tails here, this with little tails, and, and uh, the period Oh, the, so the the total pulse width here is the total round trip uh, uh, round trip time, which is essentially this. The separation between them is the round trip time. Every round trip, you know, number of nanoseconds, you are going to get a pulse, and the pulse width is the round trip time divided by the number of modes that were locked to produce it. You know, so if you have ten modes, 
and this is one this is let's say one nanosecond then you will get you know a, a, a hundred picosecond you know ten one nanosecond divided by ten roughly so yep where does that random phase come from sorry where does that random phase Oh, so that's a noise term. Um, it could, uh, meaning we are introducing, we are allowing for a noise, uh, uh, whatever mechanism it may be. I'm, we are just allowing for the possibility. Where does it physically come from? Uh, so, uh, actually, there are various sources now. If you look at a solid state laser, there's there are the, the emission time, there's, there could be a little bit of a, even though it's stimulated emission, it, it could have. A, uh, effects by phonons, it can it can have effect from vibrations and all kinds of uh, you know non idealities that that uh, may introduce this phase noise. We are going to. I wonder whether we're going to go into so that. That's a rich uh, area of physics. I mean, there may be defects in the material in the semiconductor, and uh, spontaneous emission is always occurring. There's always spontaneous emission, which is a background noise. So that's always going to create a bit of that. So very, various sources, various sources. But the main idea is, uh, uh, if we don't remember anything, this is what we should remember, that we have essentially compressed a CW, uh, but we have used many modes, you know, many uh, modes, and uh, uh, perhaps five, perhaps 10, depends on how many modes you, know, you have chosen in a particular laser. And uh, as a result, you know, com just to be clear, compared to a single mode laser, we have N modes here. Therefore, the power, CW power itself is already n times what it should be for the single mode. Does that make sense? I mean, assuming all the electric field amplitudes are the same. And on top of that, uh, so essentially this total peak here would be n squared times the electric field of one, one, one field. So this factor here, you know, the intensity, you will get a n, the maximum value of this thing function is n, right? So your, what I'm trying to say is E naught, your electric field as a function of time squared over two times eta naught. The max value will be electric field amplitude of each divided by two eta naught times big N squared, where N is the number of modes that are locked, so N squared. But then you already have N modes, so, so really the power, the total power max that you're getting out is roughly N times the power of each mode, right, of single mode. Does that make sense? Because I have n modes already taken into account here. So, so it's n times n. So, yeah. so that's the, uh, uh, the total peak power uh, uh, is related to n times the average power or, or power of each mode. Yeah. And the round trip time uh, gets scaled down by n, compressed by n to get this. So we are, today what we're going to do a little bit more is look at the uh, how do we do this? You know, I mean, how how exactly do you mode lock the laser? And uh, uh, and and if you had inhomogeneous broadening, it's pretty somewhat easy to see that yes, I can have uh, various modes. Some atoms are going that way. Some atoms are going this way. They can you, you can have a gain spectrum which is pulled down locally, so you get this whole burning in some sense. Your gain g gets pulled down here, here. So that's okay. You know, I, if I have inhomogeneous broadening. But the moment I have homogeneous broadening, this is something I had this, uh, kind of mentioned in the last class that uh, it's not extremely clear how would you go about doing that, right? But before we go, th go there, so this is the time domain analysis. You could do an equivalent analysis in the frequency domain and say that instead of modeling the time dependence of electric fields, I can say that my, my uh, amplitude in the your intensity in the frequency domain looks something like this. You know, I'm going to take a series of Gaussians, you know, this is a Gaussian. And I'll come back to this again in a little more detail later in the class today. So this is a Gaussian of the nth mode here, so I n. And uh, uh, so you're, you're, you're essentially, what we're taking here is this whole shape here. This shape is a Gaussian. And this is uh, uh, what you call an envelope of this whole shape. Uh, and uh, if that's the intensity, we can take a square root of this whole quantity and get an idea of what is the electric field. This constants, you can rescale it, you know, make it, uh, these are constants. You're just saying that I'm going to assume that it's a Gaussian. That's what you're doing. And then, you know, these are all Gaussian. Uh, this whole shape is a Gaussian, and I'm kind of taking omega c, uh, you know, t or omega naught, omega naught plus omega c, omega naught plus two omega c, and all that. And then those are the n times omega c's there, you know, so speaking. Um, and and uh, uh, just like you did in 
time domain, you can kind of come back and say that to find the time domain electric field, this is a frequency domain electric field, I'm going to do a Fourier transform and I'm going to multiply e to the j omega t, get it. And then essentially I'm going to recover an electric field which is a Gaussian now instead of a, you know, what we uh, had, had, had uh, uh, taken here to be a perfect, perfectly oscillating, you know, uh, one single frequency where Gaussian has a slightly a range of frequencies. Okay, so I'm not spending too much time on going through this detail here, but I want to kind of, uh, uh, because I'm going to use this idea now to explain how if you, instead of a inhomogeneously broadened gain spectrum, if you had a homogeneously broadened gain spectrum, you know, homogeneously broadened gain spectrum. Now, homogeneously broadened gain spectrum will not allow you to do something like this or this, you know. So, so if this is loss, this is gain, the inhomogeneous broadening can allow you to do you know, a uh, whole burning, meaning your gain spectrum can be pulled down locally, right? This frequency, I can pull down the gain spectrum locally because you're only addressing certain kinds of atoms, let's say, in a gas or, or, or you know, atoms going that way or this way. Uh, so, but in a homogeneously broadened system, all the atoms are the same, they all have the same gain, you know, line shape, so you cannot do this anymore. The whole thing has to move, right? So that's the difference in a homogeneously broadened system. So the question is, how can you do a mode lock laser with a homogeneously broadened system? It's not very clear because it, uh, in homogeneous I can kind of have many modes lasing and all that. But in a homogeneously broadened system, this whole thing is going to come down, right? And you can see that it would seem that I can only get maybe the maximum one mode, right? Not, not too many. I can't have too many modes here. Does that make sense? Make sense. Unless you had like a perfect rectangular shape which is unlikely and, and we'll see later in semiconductor lasers for example this gain spectrum has you know a very finite bandwidth and that bandwidth is controlled by how much current you inject into the laser and therefore you know the uh, uh, and and this shape is never really rectangular or flat on the top you know. but you can still make it uh, mode lock it and that's that's the thing we want to kind of look at uh, and <coughs> Uh, and, and the idea is kind of described uh, nicely in your uh, book. Uh, so, so I will actually, uh, sorry if it's a little complicated slide, but let me explain it first. You know. The idea is very straightforward. Uh, what we are going to do is we'll take the laser and what we're going to put inside it is what we're going to call as a modulator. You know. And those who have done uh, uh, you know, uh, radio physics or anything about radio, you know it's exactly the same thing as a you can do amplitude modulation or a frequency modulation, AM or FM radio. It's the, exactly the same idea, but with light now. So, uh, uh, and let me uh, go through this uh, basic idea first. So, what we are going to do is we are going to take a homogeneously broadened laser or inhomogeneously broadened laser gain medium. It doesn't matter because if you can do with homogeneous, it, it will also do it for your inhomogeneous broadening. It's not a problem. So, any laser, we could take a gain medium, okay, and Okay, so, so we have the laser gain medium and I'll explain uh, in, in, in some detail uh, so, uh, some of the uh, parameters that go into this now. Okay. okay, gain medium. And, uh, uh, right, and, and it's essentially uh, that means we have optically uh, or electrically injected this and created population inversion and it has gain. And so what I'm going to do now is, is look at a signal, which is the electric field of the o oscillating uh, of, of the light wave that's going inside. And let's say I start out here as E1 of T. That's my electric field profile, which is oscillating in time. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's, the, you know, that's the electric field profile. And essentially it goes through, uh, when I draw it this way, I, I mean it's inside here, okay, so sorry. It goes in through here and reflects, gets the gain twice, right? Comes back here. And then out here, what I'm doing is putting some other object here, which is my modulator. And I'm gonna actually physically modulate it. You know, what, does it, what do I mean by that? I'm gonna control its transmission function, Tm, as a function of time. You know, the transmission is small t, uh, and uh, electric field, uh, basically what, what, what it means is the electric field out here divided by electric field in here, E out as a function of time divided by E in as a function of time, the ratio is equal to that. 
the ratio of electric fields and with, with, at all points of time. You know. so, so this is the, uh, uh, in, in, in a certain way, the, what you can call as the transfer function or something like that in, in, in the time domain. This is the, it's the modulator. And, uh, and then um, you can see this is very similar to, uh, I think Cliff had briefly mentioned saturable absorbers and we are going to actually talk about that a little bit also today. But it's very similar to that, except it's just that you are controlling a chopper and we are assuming now we can control it at any speed. We can control it at any speed. It's, it's kind of a chopper, but it's not exactly a chopper either. Yeah. You said that the ratio of E in. Yeah, so E out. So E is the electric field here, okay, divided by E in is equal to the transmission. Oh yes, yes, that's right. It, it, it doesn't mess with the direction at all. Okay, that's right. So you can divide by electric. No, that's right. It's, it's the magnitude. Th thank you. If, if there was a confusion, there is the magnitude. Meaning, if I have electric field oscillating in that that direction, right, uh, then it, it it leaves it in that direction. It doesn't change the angle. It's it's not a polarizer or you know it's not a Kerr effect or whatever. It's it, it it doesn't change the angle. Yeah. All it does is you can think of it as like a screen. Uh, people use many of this. I mean, there are many ways you can do it uh, uh, um, I in the in the uh, uh, Q switch laser. You are using this Pockel cell or or a piezoelectric actuator. There, the idea was you don't let the light go here at all. You kind of you know let it go somewhere else, or you you kind of break the periodic condition that is necessary for uh, you to oscillate. You know. Uh, so you reject the light or you change the polarization in, with the focal cell in the Q switch. In the, in the mode lock, you don't do all that. You, you just change the intensity, the amplitude, right? Uh, for, this, for example, here. So you can think of it as, as going very dark you know, uh, uh, at, at some points of time, and then it's going completely transparent at some other times. So that's the ratio as a function of time. It's going bright, dark, bright, dark, you know, the screen, right? And uh, uh, as an example, uh, we can have this as, uh, um, uh, you know, so, so, so you can have many ways. Uh, he, here's an example. You can mathematically just write it as e to the power minus this times, you know, sine square omega m t by 2. So where I'm changing this thing with a frequency of omega m, the frequency of omega m, as an example. This would be, as an example, an amplitude modulated signal. And I'll explain right now why, why we call it an amplitude modulated signal. Yeah. Uh, or we can have e to the power minus delta squared cosine, not cosine squared, but just cosine omega t over 2. And we, I'll show later this would be a frequency modulated or a FM signal, a FM modulation of, for a mode locking. Both of them can give you mode locking. This will give you a relatively simpler mode locking. This will give you what's called chirp. Chirp means the frequency can change with time a little bit. It will you know, kind of increase, decrease, increase, decrease. That's chirp, you know, like a frequency of a bird's, uh, you know, uh, the chirping sound of a bird, the frequency goes up, down, and, and all that. So the FM will cause a bit of chirp, whereas this will not do that. You know, so. Okay, so, uh, so what happens in an AM signal in a typical radio is you have your antenna, you know, your, your signal comes in, and then uh, what you do here is you locally mix it with an AM radio, and if your signal came in with a frequency say f in and the signal of the local oscillator this is your local oscillator really was f not what you get are two side bands you know plus minus sorry f in plus minus f not what does it mean your you know from the cell phone tower your signal is coming in at a certain frequency 4 gigahertz then you have a local oscillator that shifts it to this much and this much because there's so much noise here you want to do your business somewhere else where it's quiet that's that's amplitude modulation. So, so in the same way, when I have this, we, uh, when when I have amplitude modulated signal here, we are going to show now that it is going to. Uh, we are going to have to choose a certain frequency to mode lock it. And I think by looking at the spectrum of a mode lock laser, you can tell me right away, or one can guess what what frequency should the should the modulator uh, uh, work at. And let's say I want to. 
So this is my center frequency. I want to mode lock. It will be mode locking to the next nearest and the next nearest. We will kind of locking this to the, you know, this one to this and this. So this omega m, the frequency that appears here, we'll see, will be very closely related to the round trip, uh, round trip, uh, uh, you know, the time for the round trip. It will be very closely related to that. In fact, it will be just related to an integer times the, that frequency, which is, you know, 1 over RT. We'll see that right now. Okay. Okay, so at least qualitatively, is it clear what we are doing? We are essentially changing the transmission coefficient of this little object we are put in at a certain frequency. And that frequency will be of the frequency, not of the center frequency of the laser, because we don't have any equipment that can do it that way. Center frequency of a laser, visible light, is 100 terahertz. 100 terahertz, we cannot generate an electrical signal at that fast frequency. But we can certainly do something at this frequency, and these frequencies are typically in gigahertz, 100 megahertz, something like that, right? That's the round trip time. And that, at that frequency, we can generate an electrical signal. And if I can use this electrical radio wave or a microwave signal, you know, to modulate the transmission coefficient, optical transmission coefficient of this material here, you know, uh, at, at that frequency, I can actually create this, uh, essentially shift the laser energy into these uh, nearby sidebands, you know. and and it, what it does is it, it locks this to the next nearest, it locks this to the next nearest. So essentially, it kind of locks many of them to their sidebands, and it, all of them get frequency locked, you know. and then they propagate together. And this enables you to mode lock any laser, be it homogeneous, broadened, or inhomogeneous broadened. You cannot avoid this sort of locking. So. Uh, let's go through the whole process. Th this, this process uh, you know, of explaining the full blown detail here requires a bit of math and I didn't want to kind of go through the, all the math with you. I just wanted to, uh, okay, so let me explain it. So here's your input signal that goes into this gain cell, you know, the gain medium of your cell. And the electric field, the idea is very straightforward. We're going to say that I have a modulator, I'm modulating it with, with this sort of a time domain frequency. Here's my transmission coefficient, okay? And I'm going to bring my signal, go through the gain cell, get my gain, come back, get gain again. And then I'm going to go into the modulator and get modulated, come back, get modulated again. And when I come back here, now this electric field, whatever is coming out of the modulator here, must be exactly equal to that one. And only then, only those signals are going to survive in that cell now, in, in, in that laser cavity. Does that make sense? It must be self-consistent. If my electric field that I start with goes through some modifications to the gain medium, again, in you know, a reflection, gain medium, then modulated, modulated again, comes back to where it was in the beginning, only if it actually comes back in re real phase and the electric field profiles are exactly the same, that's when they're going to add. Otherwise, they're going to be destructively interfere and go away. Does that make sense? So it's basically the same thing what we have done for lasers before. Where we, have, we had the mirror here, right? Same thing. You know, you have round, round trip phase shift and all that, except you have a little additional stuff here, which is the modulator, right? an extra thing now. And, uh, and the math of it can get a little bit involved, uh, which uh, uh, is why I try to put it together in, the, in these pictures here rather than trying to derive it all. It is, it is a little involved, but let me just l go through it with you a little bit. Here's the electric field profile. Now, you see right away the electric field profile is written as a Gaussian, as a Gaussian. You know? And the electric field profile, let me write that down first. I mean, uh, we, we, if we understand the way the electric field looks, the rest of it should really be easy. First of all, the electric field going through any laser cavity is oscillating. We know that, right? The electric field is oscillating. In fact, it's oscillating very fast you know, in time and in space. And how is it oscillating in time? Electric field is always going as e to the power j omega naught t, where omega naught is the center frequency, or the you know, color of the light determines that omega naught. Right? Frequency and speed of light are related. And again, I mean, just to omega naught is equal to 2 pi times the frequency naught, and c is frequency times, oh, sorry, nu naught times the wavelength, right? So, so we know that. Much, right? So it's just. Uh, you know, th that frequency. But then, uh, uh, you know, the amplitude of this wave that's going through this cell, we are saying from the very beginning that, look, I know that this will going to generate, is going to generate pulses for me, not a continuous wave, not a continuous amplitude. It's going to generate pulses in time. 
So how do I model a pulse in time? I'm going to put in an exponential with time, a Gaussian with time. And how does that look? It basically looks like e to the power minus a t squared. No. So, so what does it mean? So uh, let's say this is t is equal to zero, and when you can, when I put t is equal to zero and I have a negative sign, I think you, I hope you realize that it's kind of, you know, going forward and backward. So, so you can move your t is equal to zero anywhere, and then this becomes t minus some t naught squared. It, it, it really, <coughs> the zero of it is. You, you take a snapshot and you say, well, this is where my t is equal to zero was. Let's say. So let's say. Yeah. What delta t p? Sorry. Delta t p. Yeah, I'm going to explain that. No, that's right. So this delta t p is going to be um, uh, the pulse. It, the, physically, what what does this mean? Let me let me plot this out. So if if I now uh, I absorb that, you know, if you take this, all this are two log two. These are all normalization factors because later you integrate and they, they cancel out. Okay. So this two log two over delta t p. Uh, uh, squared is what we call as this a. You know, we lump them all co all constants into this little a that I put here. But physically, this uh, looks. This is a normalization factor, and you get a t over delta t p whole squared. And when I draw the pulse, okay, it's going to look like this. Okay? The pulse is going to look like this. This is my electric field amplitude now, e of t. And physically, what 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 does this product mean? It means that the pulse width. Here is delta T p. Now, this is what it physically means, the width of the pulse. But inside the pulse, it's going crazy. It's going like, you know, it's, it's really a very fast moving. Because what is the frequency here? That's 2 pi by the center frequency. Right? It's, 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 this is terahertz. This thing is terahertz, but the pulse is kind of slower. And it, it, you know, it, it goes like that. So, so that's the pulse width. That makes sense? And that pulse is going to propagate now. See, uh, ordinarily, what, what we, we would assume is this delta TP. You can take delta TP to infinity, very large number. Then you'll get your normal continuous wave. Amplitude is the same everywhere, right? So does that make sense? You make the pulse width very large. It becomes a normal you know, same amplitude wave, which we have already done. But now, because we are putting the modulator, and we know we're going to get pulses out, we're saying, let's choose this rather than a you know, flat amplitude uh, situation. So we start with that, and our electric field looks like a constant times a Gaussian pro, you know, pro, pro, pulse profile times your normal oscillator, which is going this way. Right? So, right? That's the input electric field. And uh, if you take a Fourier transform of that, you know, the nice thing about a Gaussian pulse is the Fourier transform is also a Gaussian. Right? And the Gaussian is centered around your center frequency, e to the power minus omega minus omega naught, or 4a, this whole square. It's the Gaussian. So well, physically, what, what, we, what do we mean? Uh, if you go to the frequency domain, e of omega, which is essentially e of t, e to the power you know, uh, t, <coughs> dt. You know, so so that, that's e of omega. Uh, so this. You know, very fast frequency is going to, going to determine where are you, where is the center, right? And all the spread is going to determine you, you're going to have a Gaussian spread like that. So that's that's your frequency domain picture. Here is also a Gaussian centered around omega naught, and that's what this formula is telling you, right? Now you feed that into the gain medium, and and the gain medium when the electric field goes through the gain medium, what, what, what happens to the electric field? It gets amplified. I mean, that's the optical amplifier. It gets amplified. By how much? Depends on the gain spectrum, right? And the gain spectrum here, uh, let's write that down. Uh, OK, so I'll leave this. So the gain spectrum, we are assuming now it's a homogeneously broadened gain spectrum. And physically, I can sketch the gain spectrum. Okay. And here's. Uh, we can maybe take some liberties of moving a little ahead and say that, well, here's an example of a gain spectrum from semiconductors. Here's an example of a gain spectrum, homogeneously broadened gain spectrum. It looks something like that. It looks something like that. Uh, so gain is negative outside a certain window and positive within a certain window. So outside this window of frequencies, you have loss, loss, you have gain within this window. 
in semiconductors. So sometimes you, 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 you know, actually most of the times it's like that. Sometimes we have already seen earlier, you can have a gain spectrum that would look like that, but let's just look at this. So the gain spectrum, and you have a center frequency of omega naught, and it has a kind of a parabolic shape. Uh, uh, most of them do. And so what we do here is we are going to take a functional form of the gain spectrum, which is, which is written here, uh, and then say that the maximum value of the gain you know, let's say is, is a gamma at omega naught. Well, that's the maximum value. And, and the functional form of that, we're going to assume, so, so here's an assumption, we're going to assume that the gamma at omega naught is the maximum value. It reaches maximum there. And it's going to decay on both sides. You know, it's, it's kind of a nice uh, way to parameterize the whole thing parameterize it. Uh, sorry, I think we have a delta omega over 2. What does that mean? Now, this physically means this is delta omega, right? And you can take the absolute value of this. You'll see you get a 1, one plus, you know, omega minus omega naught over whole squared, right? If you take the absolute value. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm really, yeah. Right? So you get the shape. So this is your, what you call as the transfer function through, for the electric field as it goes through the gain medium. So the, here, here's your, you know, here's your uh, uh, frequency uh, gain, or, or rather frequency dependent gain. And then the electric field goes through it. And when it comes out on the other side, what happens, how do you find the electric field on the other side? Well, you take, uh, when it comes out through here, what all you have to do is take your electric field Fourier transform, and you multiply by the Fourier transform of the gain gain here, or which which you have there, which is the transfer function, right? This is any linear time invariant system is going to do this. Meaning, when you send a signal, you know, in and it has a transfer function of h, what you know, let's say input is i, what comes out, if you know the frequency domain thing, it comes out as multiplied in the frequency domain, right? You you know that much, right? So the same thing here. That's what's happening here. So essentially the signal goes in, gets a gain of this, this you know, T. Uh, all right, so this is the gain spectrum, gamma, not as a function of omega. Sorry, gamma as a function of omega, it's the gain spectrum. But how much does the electric field get amplified? Right. If that's the gain, I think we, we have, uh, I think probably misused the name quite a bit, but if you remember, the electric field magnification is e to the power gamma times Lg, right? right? That's the, how much the electric field gets amplified. That's how many extra photons you have in an E squared and all that. So this is the gain per unit length, right? That's what we have written there. So as a result, what we really must do is take this whole thing, right? Take this whole thing and find its e to the power of that thing. And, and then you find your real gain. Right, e to the power of this thing. And that's what's done there on the top. You know, that's written as T, big T here. You see that uh, on the top, uh, uh, before you do that, you kind of do a little bit of a Taylor expansion here. Uh, I, you know, this is the reason I'm, I don't want to derive all of it. You do a little Taylor expansion and say that this is, this, we are not going too far away from the center frequency. Therefore, this quantity is not much larger than one. You can take this to the numerator, expand it to two orders you know, a linear term and a parabolic term. And then you exponentiate it to find the total gain function. And you go once, you go twice, in between you have a reflection loss gamma one. So what comes out here is your electric field two, E2. And all, all I'm saying is once you take all of this into account, the fact that you have a gain, in fact, you have reflection, you get gamma one due to reflection, you get tw two passes through the gain medium, you get your electric field, this is the electric field output, right? You convert it back into time domain, you get here's the electric field in time domain. It's still a Gaussian, very nice. Right? A Gaussian going through a, you know, the system remained a Gaussian. And it's just that its pulse has changed, its pulse width has changed. Instead of T squared by A, uh, sorry, instead of this A here, you have become of one over four Q, and you know here's the change. So the, here's a little bit of a change in the pulse width for you. That's the change in the pulse width of the Gaussian frequency. It has not messed with it. It's left it as omega naught. 
no mess with the frequency, but, but the pulse width has changed a little bit. And there is obviously gain, you know, all the stuff sitting in the front, you know, it's, there's gain, the increased in electric field amplitude here. Question? Yeah. Correct. But that's just the second half. There's an exponential of that, something plus that. You did the Taylor expansion about that to get the gamma. Uh huh. Gamma yeah, yeah. Um, then the three terms, that's the Taylor expansion. What's the first term and why is that all in an exponential? Good point. That's right. Yeah, okay. So that's. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, I think what you're asking then, uh, Stephanie, is the, what is this term? Yeah. And yeah. Why okay, good. Is yeah. Uh, right, because the whole second half of that. Yeah. Is so this is. Exponential. Yeah, so this is the gain coefficient, okay? Yeah. Right? Yeah, okay. So, uh, coefficient. And, and so the physical gain is e to the power of that, right? Right. Now you are asking something that an, is an exponential. All right, so, so if that's the gain coefficient, so then. Yeah. But that's all inside of an exponential as well. And there's this other term for this thing. Yeah. So this extra term is, uh, all right. So as the photons are propagating, right, with a wave vector k, you will always have a phase change of jk times the distance, right? If you just propagate a distance lg, you will always have this no matter whether you have gain or not, right? As a, as a photon propagates, right? Uh, this this part uh, will will appear no matter whether we have gain or not, right? And all the extra terms that we see there, right? So this times e to the power. Uh, let me put it this way. So for one pass, so you get a you know this is the phase factor because of one one pass, and the gain factor would would be e to the power gamma times l g, and gamma here. You can say it's one minus j omega minus omega naught by all that plus squared x squared by two j squared is minus so you know yeah does that make sense yeah. one by two so you just take this whole thing and you just plop it in here right and then that thing comes here and that's your the combined thing is what we are calling as the gain transfer function. The combined thing. It includes both the phase, normal phase uh, change uh, because of propagation plus the gain terms and all the things are gained. I mean, you can turn off the gain, you will just get the normal. Okay, so now you go through this and uh, after uh, you come out from the, you know, with two, two passes, uh, your electric field profile looks like this. It is still a Gaussian. It has a slightly deformed uh, line shape. Uh, sorry, not line shape, but the pulse width, if you might, 4Q. And it's changed from just you know, A there to something like this, plus this. This is the uh, factor that is introduced by the, by the, uh, uh, by the uh, gain medium. So, so it's really, the, only this window has the gain, and it introduces this factor. And then now you go through the main part, which is, which is the modulator. And the modulator, you can choose. I mean, here's an example of amplitude modulator. It goes as e to the power minus delta squared. Delta is just a number here sine square omega t. Why do we choose like that? Why do we choose sine square omega t? Why, why is that an amplitude modulator? Because if you do e to the power minus sine square omega t, so the idea is what is t is equal to zero for us, it's going to be the leading edge of the pulse that reaches you know, the modulator. Let's say the modulator is sitting there. Right? And so around t is equal to zero, this function, sine, sine x is very close to x, so this looks like delta squared omega m squared t squared by 4, right? Because sine x around t is equal to 0 is x is equal to 0 is roughly equal to x. And you see this function is also a Gaussian in time. Right? And so is the incoming electric field, Gaussian in time. So it's a pulse which is Gaussian. It comes in, there's a Gaussian, the modulator intensity or transmission function is a Gaussian too. You can square it, you can take 10 times square, it's always going to remain a Gaussian, right? So, 
So, so this is a Gaussian two, and what's going to do now? Uh, so, when your signal goes through the light goes through the modulator, this is the transmission function. Then here, what you do is you don't multiply with the trans. You know, uh, what you do is you can again multiply the signal, the electric field times the transmission function, e in. Where, where did I write that? All right, so e out by e in, right? Is equal to your Gaussian that we just we just wrote delta squared omega m squared t squared over two. So we just wrote that. So output the electric field that comes out here is equal to divided by this is equal to that. That's all, right? Then you do it twice and do another reflection here gamma one uh, gamma two come back and you have a new function now which is e three. Does that make sense? So you come back the whole loop. Uh, it took almost the whole class to do this. I thought it will get done very soon, but all right. E3 is now you see it has everything. It has gamma 1, reflection from there, gamma 2, reflection from there, and all this e to the power g naught and all that is because of gain here. j omega t still remains, and you get this very interesting, slightly modified uh, uh, exponential or a Gaussian pulse shape. And the Gaussian pulse shape has all the information as well. It has 1 over 4q. 4q came about because of this aspect here. You see the q, right? And then it uh, introduced this plus 2 delta omega and all that. That came about because of this. Right? So it has all that information inside. Then the electric field that comes back, E3t, is essentially uh, colliding with this in, 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 you know, ingoing electric, uh, the, the one, one that started. And the, the, these two must be exactly the same, right? And only then this is an allowed field inside this cavity. Does that make sense? That's the idea. So to go through this complicated feature, when mathematics may be complicated, but you know the uh, uh, physically it has no problem. It does it 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 does mode locking all the time. You know, it's just the ma mathematical details are a little bit messy. But experimentally, it's very easy to mode lock it this way. So what it's saying now is the moment I equate e3 and e1, you know e3 and the e, you know initial here. It tells me what parameter should I choose for my omega n, which is the modulation frequency, for my gain, for my length, and all that, such that I get it to mode lock. The moment I satisfy those conditions, I will get a mode lock laser. For example, omega n, what frequency should I modulate it at? If from there, you would see the omega n times the round trip, you know, round trip time should be equal to 2 times pi times the integer. The moment you choose that, you're going to mode lock it. And that was, I think, hopefully, rather clear from the beginning because you know we, we said that this this feature is very similar to amplitude modulation and this is omega naught and this is 1 over 2 pi tau round trip right so as a result you if you want to mode log this and this your modulation frequency which should be exactly equal to this or this or this this should that's the relation it should be equal to that okay so so that's 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 uh, that's how often you need to open your window and close it, and the transmission function should change in a Gaussian fashion too. So, so that's, uh, uh, that's the basic idea. The, how do you, uh, the once you create these, uh, it gives you the physical numbers that you need to maintain to get the mode locking. Yeah. Now you can slightly change it. Uh, you can go to this form. Instead of sine squared there, you can go to cosine squared. And when you go to cosine squared, I think you know that for small time t close to 0, Cosine x goes as 1 minus x squared by 2, right? Not this. Uh, so, so as a result, this thing will become 1 minus omega m squared t squared by 2, something like that. The, the exact details are not terribly important. Uh, sorry, what did I do? I should have written j. Sorry about that. I said there should be a j here. There should be no j here. Amplitude modulation is not a complex transmission function. Frequency modulation is a complex transmission function, it's called delta. Okay. And so what it, this does is now this function, you see there is a one constant with time, and there's another which is increasing with time. Okay. And the constant part here is going to add to the, for fm, you get a e to the power j omega naught t, and then this phase is going to add, you know, uh, after you come out, right? right so. Uh, I'm going to just parameterize all my time parameters into this t naught, you know, for all. after I've propagated it through all my gain medium and I've come here and I'm waiting to do either AM or FM, this part. 
and then it gets multiplied by this whole whole bunch here, the transmission function, right? So J delta square one minus omega m square t square by two. So this, so you see now that the frequency J omega naught t, the frequency is modulated with time. It's changing with time now. Right? The frequency is not just omega naught, but it is a constant. You know, th th there is something that you know, does not depend on time and there is a certain thing that's increasing with time. So j, so there is a constant e to the power j constant plus omega naught t plus some t squared. So this thing is, the frequency is changing with time. For this, you know, and then this is a frequency modulated signal. Fortunately, we are kind of running out of time today. But uh, so, so once I put this in and I put the modulator in, I do it a gigahertz or even a megahertz frequency modulation of the transmission function. What comes out from here is really a, a pulse, a pulses of the laser, no matter whether your gain medium has homogeneous broadening or inhomogeneous broadening. So you get these pulses out now. And the distance between pulses is the round trip phase time, uh, you know, uh, and, and the width is round trip divided by the number of modes that get locked by this procedure. And uh, and, and, and really, that, that, that's really the main idea. Uh, the math is a little messy, but I hope you can read through and, and, and uh, get through it once. I just want to point it out because it makes use of a lot of these concepts of Fourier series. Sometimes you want to be in time domain, sometimes in Fourier, go back and forth. But in the end, it actually works out. It tells you physically that you need to match the electric fields in the end. And if you can, then that mode is allowed. And it's a, here, it's a mode lock laser. The end result is a mode lock laser. So, yeah, Why is both I'm, I'm So why is omega squared and t squared and two not squared? Or is it supposed to be squared? You mean here? Yeah. Ah, OK. So uh, let me rewrite it. It's. Let's say cosine of omega mt, all right? So cosine uh, uh, yeah, omega m squared t squared by 2, right? Uh, because cosine of x is 1 minus x squared by 2, roughly. So Uh, sine x is no, that's not my question. oh is x therefore and you have a square of that so whatever is sitting here gets squared right so you get omega squared t squared by two square which is four yeah, that's is, that is that what you mean sorry is that for small x oh only for small x that's right okay but I guess in the beginning you had written down it was cosine of omega mt over two oh did I write that yeah you did all right write write that all right, then then cancel that. This is this is the correct one. Sorry about that. If there's a two, so I see, I see. Okay. No, if if I had written a two, cancel it. But you know, the thing is, this is a constant. All these factors you can absorb it there. The physically, there's a phase and not changing with time. There's one that's changing with time. That's kind of the idea. Okay. But yeah, thanks for pointing out. That was an error then. <laughs>